How's it going, Ping Pirates crew? It's Adrian, and we're back with another video. So today, we're going to continue our series on looking at the fundamentals of the game of One Piece, seeing what we could learn by stripping them down to like their bare bones and kind of analyzing them. Today, we are going to be focusing on one of, if not honestly, the most basic and fundamental topic of the game, which is playing on curve. And I'm going to get into all of that in detail later on in the video. But right now, I want to move over to a scenario for you guys. And I want you guys to answer this for me before we jump in. So pause the video if you need to, but basically the situation is this. You are the NL player, you have just played 9 cost Yamato. Now the turn is swinging over to the Sakazuki, he has 10 Dawn up. And uh, he's going to do something very specific. So he's going to swing 5k here at your leader. Do you counter this swing? He's going to minus 1 onto the Yamato. And then he's going to swing 6k, do you counter that swing? So now that you have that scenario in your head and you're kind of thinking about it, let's take a step back and talk about what playing on curve even is, you know, how can we learn from it, what can we really do to improve on it. So let's start off by explaining what playing on curve even means. This term comes from Magic the Gathering, I'm pretty sure, but I, to me it comes from Hearthstone, honestly. And playing on curve basically means that you are using all of your resources. In this case, for One Piece it's Dawn. You're using all of your Dawn on a singular card or some specific card combo that's really strong. So in terms of singular cards, think about this like on Katakuri having one Dawn, they play Pudding. When they have three Dawn, they play Parospero, five Dawn Gadatsu, and then seven, um, seven Mom. And then in terms of card combos, think of Sakazuki being on 8 Dawn and playing Rebecca Hinoluchi. That is like one of the most infamous combos and it's also a on-curve play. I also want to add that there are things like curving out, which means that you're using all of your Dawn, but maybe you're not necessarily using it in the most efficient way. I think the easiest example that I could give you guys is, let's say that you're playing something like Enel and you don't have like a 4 Dawn play. Most people just swing 9 at lead and then call it a day. This is something that is curving out. You're technically using all of your Dawn towards something, but you're not really developing your board state. You're not really progressing the game forward. You're just kind of like swinging at life. And again, these concepts are extremely simple, but they get really complicated when you start thinking about them at the higher level. So let's move on to why thinking about these curves is so important. So firstly, I'm not gonna focus too much on this. I don't think I need to tell you guys this, but understanding your own curve is crucial to your piloting of a deck. You should know what your best curve plays are. You should know on a turn-by-turn -turn basis what your best plays are and why. This is super important and honestly the first step to playing optimally. You want to be making the least amount of mistakes because mistakes lead to tempo swings, they lead to disadvantage states, and all of that jazz that you do not want to mess with. So yeah, having an idea of what you want to do every single turn and not having to think about that is super, super important. But what is equally or even more important I'd say is understanding what your opponent's curve is as well. And I think a lot of players struggle with this mainly because there's just so much knowledge that you have to know to really understand this. In the meta right now I would say there are like five to six decks that you could guarantee yourself seeing when you go to like a bigger tournament. You should be able to understand what their turn by turn basis and goals are because if you're able to understand what they want to do every single turn, then you are able to understand what you can do to play around those turns. And that understanding is super crucial to getting more advanced at the game because then you could start predicting what your opponent is going to do and then you could start taking countermeasures to kind of play around it. This is so, so important to think about when you're kind of in a neutral board state where you know you and your opponent are even because those tempo plays and how you play to your advantages are gonna be really important for the future turns. And if you take away anything from this video, it would be this point. You really want to understand what your opponent's curve does and what you could do and fit within your curve to respond to that. And also on a higher level of thinking, you also wanna understand that your opponent is probably good as well. And they're probably also prepping for what you want to do. So you need to prep what they have prepped and it kind of just goes in like a circle. I think about this as kind of similar to how chess players will play out like the first four to five turns just like autopiloting and not really thinking about it because they're playing board states that they really already understand. And you might think, Adrian, <laughs> this is one piece. It is not the same at all, but it kind of is. I'd be willing to bet money that most, if not all advanced players or top players at this game 
can think a turn or two turns ahead, you know, three plus turns ahead. Because at the end of the day, the decisions that you make come all the way down to this fundamental idea of playing on curve. What you want to counter out with, when you want to swing, what you want to keep in hand, this is all dictated by what you think the board is going to look like between you and your opponent and the interactions that you and your opponent think are going to have. And most of the time, the person that's thinking farther ahead will win out most of the time and have you the more skillful player. But that's enough from me. Let's see what this looks like practically. We're gonna be going back to the scenario that I gave you guys at the beginning of the video and kind of analyzing it. This is also gonna be great info because I've had a couple of people ask me at Locals, you know, last video you were asking us to analyze things. I don't really know how to do that. So now you're gonna get some analysis from me that I personally do. This scenario is something that's very close to me. I did it maybe two or three times at Nats and they ended up giving me like advantages in the game that kind of led me to win. This is also something I've seen from players in other tournaments, whether that be like the CS videos or tournaments that I've calmed over. So with that being said, let's go back to the scenario and I really want you to hone in on this like playing on curve. Okay, so just in case you missed it at the beginning of the video or you just need a reminder, the situation we're looking at, we're looking at it from the NL's perspective. Uh, we've just played nine costs Yamato, uh, probably KO'd like a Hina or something like that. We're back up at two life and then the Sakazuki is starting off their turn with Tendon. Now the situation is this, and we'll see it uh, play out a little bit here. The Sakazuki is swinging 5k, and they're going to minus your Yamato. Uh, I'm not going to show what the NL player does here, but do you counter this? And if so, why? Uh, if you don't, why not? And then also, if he then swings with Luchi right afterwards, still leaving Tendon up, he minus your Yamato. Your Yamato's at 8 now. Do you counter the Luchi swing? So, do you counter the Sokka swing? Do you counter the Luchi swing? Why or why not? That is what we're trying to figure out with this situation here. This is, again, from a real-life scenario that I've seen in my games, and also that I've seen in actual tournaments that I've calmed over. So before I play what actually happens, and kind of what you're supposed to do in this situation, lock in what you would do for your answer and why, and uh, we're gonna see how this situation plays out. So, Sakazuki swings 5k, minus is 1, onto the Yamato making it eights. And then of course, we're gonna counter 1K here. And we counter 1K to stay at two life. So we go to Luchi swing, and then we counter out of that too. This kind of goes against NL's general game plan, right? In general, when, especially if um, another person is swinging at you, you don't really care as long as you have something like Katakuri or something like Yamato to bring you back up. You want the extra cards in hand, right? Especially in this situation where Sakazuki only has two swings. If we're at two life, if he's swinging with both of them, we're still at one life by the end of the turn no matter what. So you might be asking yourself, okay then, if that's the game plan, why do we counter out 5k and then 6k? This gives my opponent two cards and I'm still at two life. Yamato is not online anymore. I mean, she still is. She, You could still uh, KO a 4 cost with her. She's just not giving you any life. Uh, and also, we don't really have anything on board that we could Katakuri back, like a Shirahoshi. So if you're struggling to find an answer to this question, uh, we're going to go back through the scenario, play with an open hand, and see if we could figure out what's going on. And you want to be keeping everything we've been talking about in mind, about curves, about what your strongest plays are, and also the understanding and the back and forth between two curves. So now we're gonna go into the scenario with an open hand. And before we go into like the actual play that goes down, let's talk about, you know, kind of bringing it all together. What about the curve does this have to say? What can we learn from the scenario? So it's Sakazuki's turn right now. What do they want to do with their turn? You know, what is Sokka's goal for the turn, right? What is Sokka's goal for the turn? And Sokka's goal for the turn is Honestly, to just get rid of this Yamato, we don't want this big thing swinging at us, uh, especially since it would have to constitute a blocker to deal with. So Sokka's goal is to get rid of Yamato. And there's a bunch of different combinations you could get rid of Yamato, right? You could do like Borsalino plus Ice Age. You could do like a bunch of minuses plus like a Houndblaze or something like that. There's a lot, right? But there's one very clear way to get rid of the Yamato with Sakazuki that is like miles better than the rest. And I want you to look at the Sakazuki's hand and see if you can spot it. So 
They it looks like they have a Murakumo, two Rebecca's, a Borsalino, a Hina, and a Suru. So with Tendon, with what you know about curves, what do you think is the most efficient play that the Sakazuki could do here? And with that in mind, we'll watch it play out again, this time with an open hand. So we swing 5k, there comes a counter, Yamato's 8 uh, cost now. Luchi comes down for the swing, we're gonna counter 2k. And now we see what the curve play is. It's rest 3 for Hina, give minus 4 to the Yamato. Now this Yamato is at 4 costs. And being at 4 costs is extremely important because that is the perfect range for a 7 cost Borsalino play. And we'll see that 7 cost Borsalino come out. And look at how big this tempo swing is. This is the best play to do on this curve because it uses up all of your Dawn. It achieves the goal that you want, which is getting rid of the Yamato, and it even establishes two bodies on the board. And then at this point, you're asking yourself, okay, that's really that's really cool, Adrian, but why did the NL counter 1k, 2k when they could have had more cards in hand to deal with this board right now? And again, this goes into what is the NL's goal, right? What is the NL's goal for the turn? In general, uh... I mean, Enel is going to be reactive towards this sort of thing because it's not their turn, right? So they want to counter. They want to counter in a way that lets them have two life and some bodies. This could be a big body. This could be like something like uh, Ohm Holly or something like that to go wide. But the main problem here is this seven cost Borsalino. In general, Enel hates small things being on the board with big things. So a board like this is actually incredibly threatening. If we don't address it, they have four swings and we could potentially be going down to one and getting a lot of cards out of our hand, right? And this is why it's so important that you should understand your opponent's curves, not just your own, because you should also understand what plays to make to respond to those really strong plays. And again, if you were able to see this play, uh, props to you. If not, um, you know, this is why I'm making these videos. It's kind of to get us used to um, thinking like this and thinking ahead. So now we're kind of turning it backwards. Uh, now, Enel is the proactive player. So what does Enel want to do on his turn? Does Enel want to do on his turn? So let's think about that. What does the Enel want to address? And the main thing is board, right? It's pretty much the same thing as Sakazuki. We want the board to be as least threatening as possible so that we could continue going and grinding into this game, right? Because if you notice, Sakazuki's only at four cards now. This is where Enel really thrives. So, so in this case, Enel wants to address Sakazuki board. And there's multiple different ways we could do that, right? How? Once we get to these Tendon plays, uh, there's th th we kind of have options. And this situation is pretty unique to where like each card in our hand kind of does a different thing, right? So starting off with our 7 cost play, we could 7 cost Enel and kind of attack into the Luchi, right? 7 cost Enel, attack into Luchi. Now what does this give us? This leaves 2 Dawn up for us, which is really good because we could swing 6k into the Luchi first and see if they want to give counter. And if they do, we could then rush Enel and swing 8k. This is good because it would probably get rid of the Luchi. I can't imagine a Sakazuki player at four cards giving up three cards uh, to protect this thing, especially when lethal is not guaranteed here. And also, it puts a pretty sticky attacker onto the board, but it's pretty good for us. We have a 7k on the board that we can now use to swing. But there's one big issue with this play. The issue is this Borsalino here, with one Dawn attachment, it's already swinging 9k into our NL because we're using the NL to swing at this Luchi, so it's going to be rested. That means if we want to save it, we pretty much have to either give them two cards or give them this top life, which we do not want to do for a one Dawn investment because now that opens us up to things like Houndblaze, to things just like removing the Enel, and they get that for free pretty much. And in the next coming turns, they still have these two attackers that we cannot really deal with right now. Again, going kind of up the ladder, we also have the 8 cost Kata play. 8 cost Kata into Big Borsa. So basically, 
uh, playing eight cost Katakuri, and instead of making us gain a life, we're going to put the Borsa into the Sakazuki's life. This play is pretty good because it gets rid of the biggest threat on the board, the Borsalino, and it also leaves the Sakazuki with really low swings. So Sokka doesn't like having low swings against Enel here because it's pretty inconvenient since if he's swinging with these characters, we could then retaliate with our own characters. We now have like an 8 cost Katakuri on board that we could swing into, and also the 8 cost Katakuri is actually, it could be difficult to get rid of, right? The only caveat to this is, of course, you are playing 8 cost Kata on something, that means that the, uh, the Sakazuki is going to gain a life. So they have basically have more time to play the game, but this might not be the worst thing considering they only have 4 cards in hand. It could potentially be dangerous if they run something like 10 cost Kaido, but in today's meta, I don't think a lot of people do, right? So 8 cost Kata, that might be a really good play. And then we move on to 9 cost Yamato. Now, in this case, um, we could do kind of a test swing at Luchi, 6k. And here, if they want to give us the counter for that, that's great. We get to Yamato the Hina for free. We've basically removed two things on board for free. That's, of course, only if they want to give us the Luchi. And then, of course, if they counter out of it, we could always just play Yamato, KO the Luchi straight up. Again, this play is good because you're removing something off the board. But in my opinion, it's kind of bad. You're basically paying 9 Dawn for a Jet Pistol. And, of course, you get the big thing. You get the big Yamato on board. But also, there are many different ways for Sakazuki to kind of handle it, so you want to use Yamato very sparingly, and make sure you're KOing something, and also gaining a life to get the maximum value. Because if they were to get rid of this Yamato here, then it would actually be very difficult um, to come back from the game, because we don't have a lot of options in our hand. So keeping all of these things in mind, let's see what actually happens here. So we're just thinking about the play, and then we see 8 Dawn come out, and Borsalino is going to get bottom life into the category. So if that was your answer, if you're an Enel player especially, it was pretty obvious that was the play. And this also answers your question on why do we get rid of two cards in this situation to stay at two life. When you think of Enel's game plan, you know, you want to be at one life and then heal back up to two, but there are situations like this in particular where you just want to be at two life because you're going to use Katakuri to remove something. And not only does the NL player understand that, they also should understand that this Borsalino combo is one of the most efficient ways to get rid of Yamato. Again, these are curves clashing against each other. Can you imagine if this NL player went into like autopilot mode and just like took this 5k and this 6k and then cycled like how you would regularly do it? In that scenario, the best thing that you could do is 9 cost Yamato, the Hina away, but that still leaves a Borsa, Luchi, and uh, leader to swing at you. And then on top of that, if they're able to get rid of your Yamato again, you are like really, really screwed. And on top of that, you cannot do this Katakuri play if you're at one life. It is way too dangerous, especially with three swings on the board. So again, the NL player understands that. So to respond to this, they're saving this eight cost Katakuri play. And if you look at this specific board state in general as well, this is a really good board state for NL. Sakazuki has to go even wider on four cards, which is going to be very difficult. And also, Sakazuki being at three life is really beneficial for us right now because most of their cards are four cost. That opens up options for things like Yamato to come out. So again, this was such a simple interaction, but there's so much depth that goes into it and so much thinking on both players' sides that they have to consider. If you are wondering what makes you different from a top player, this is pretty much it. A lot of the game comes down to just understanding what to do in certain board states, understanding what your opponent wants to do, and what you should do in response to that. So getting better at this specific skill, I think, is just the absolute foundation for any other like advanced skill that you want to learn. And this is also why I think you should be studying these curves like outside of the game. You kind of want them to be in your muscle memory so you don't even have to think about this. This was one of the most common plays that came up when I was playing NL at Nats, and I never once had to even think about what to do, and that gave me so much mental space to think about the actual complicated scenarios that came up that I've never seen before, as opposed to something like this that's very, very streamlined and very like flowcharty. So yeah, if you were struggling or you were wondering why, you know, certain players are able to kind of call out your plays, um, this is pretty much it. It's pretty much they just understand your curve, they understand what they want to do with their curve, and also how to counter your curve with the cards that they have. And this is what I think is the first step to becoming a more advanced player of the game. You should be able to do this, and you should have a general understanding of what your opponent is going to be doing. So again, I would try to analyze this concept 
into the ground, honestly. It is the most fundamental thing in One Piece, in my opinion, and everything else kind of builds upon it. And we're gonna be focusing on all of those things in the next coming videos. So thank you guys so much for watching this video on playing on Curve. Next time I make one of these videos, we're going to be talking about resource management, but I really wanted to talk about this topic first because understanding what your opponent is going to do and what you wanna do is super important for that topic. If you guys liked this video, please leave a comment, let me leave a like, and also please subscribe. It means the world to me when you guys are able to support in numbers like that. It really motivates me to keep on going despite having such a busy schedule. My day job is being a school teacher, so I could get very busy throughout the day. But seeing all those positive comments and seeing all the support that I get is what keeps me making these videos. The next video in the series is going to be talking about resource management, but the next video I want to do is maybe some VOD reviews. If this is something you're interested in, don't don't hesitate to kind of DM me on Twitter. I'm going to leave it in the description down below and we could work some VOD review out. I've been wanting to do something like this and kind of help people, individual people analyze their plays and kind of the thought process that goes into it. So if you're interested in that, DM me on Twitter. I'm going to leave it down in the description down below or just comment at me if you want to contact me through email or something like that. But with that being said, good luck on whatever you guys are doing, whether that be work, school, tournaments, anything at all really. And I'll see you on the next one.